Continuing on in our introduction to the book of Genesis, uh, last week we covered these six points, the title, the author, the date the book was written, and the audience to whom it was written, as well as the structure of the book and the style of the book. And I guess a little bit on why the depth of this intro. There are a lot of questions that are brought up, a lot of scrutiny that's brought up uh, towards Genesis, and most of these take place before we even get into the book, which is unfortunate, but uh, it is the case in our modern era, and so I feel it is important for us to take the time to you know, lay the foundation of what we're going to be going through in Genesis. How do we answer some of these questions like, did Moses really write the book, or was it for other people anonymous people across time who wrote the book, what is the style of the book, and such things like this, because uh, how we determine these questions, what our answers to are these questions, uh, not a, only affects how we read Genesis, it also affects how we read the entire Bible. Genesis is quoted many, many times in the New Testament, and if you take Genesis in a particular way, you are then led to believe, well, this is the same way Jesus and the apostles and the New Testament writers also took Genesis. And so, to review these six points just quickly, the title of the book is Genesis in our English, which means origins, generations. In the Hebrew, it's Bereshit, which means in the beginning, both having this concept that Genesis is the book of beginnings, it's the book of origins, it's the book of generations. We also talked about the author. Now, the author is Moses, and I went through the reasons why I disagree with the documentary hypothesis that these four anonymous people in these different eras uh, wrote this book, and that a priestly source compiled those. I don't see evidence for this, and I see evidence of the contrary. And we went through a number of passages that spoke of Moses writing things down within the law, and how the New Testament accredits Moses to writing the Torah. And therefore, the date of writing would have to be between 1446 to 1405 BC. We get those dates because we can pretty concretely say the Red Sea took place in 1446 BC, and we just count from there till Moses' death. And the audience to whom Moses wrote the book originally was Israel to the first and second generations leaving Egypt. It was written to tell them, why is God giving them this land? And who God is and what he is not, a contrast to the pagan gods that they worshipped in Egypt and the pagan gods that the nations that they are going into worship. And later, we see that it is to Israel nationally as a reminder of them, the promises of God and the law. And in many ways, it is also to the church. Because many of the promises given in Genesis, we see benefit us because salvation comes through many of the promises given in this book. We also talked about the sections and how this book is broken up into 11 sections uh, through this phrase, Ele Toledot, that is used 11 times throughout this book. And every time that it is used, it draws the reader's focus back to a particular line. You get to a line like Ishmael and Esau, and there's only a handful of verses on them because the author isn't really concerned on them except to say, this is how God fulfilled his promises to them. But he immediately right, goes right back to the line that goes from Adam to Abraham and to his son Isaac and to his son Jacob and Jacob's 12 sons, which make up Israel. And that is the origin of Israel. Uh, one thing that I guess I will give a correction that I didn't clarify uh, last week. I said 10 sections when I meant 11 sections. Most commentaries that will break them up into these sections will do 10. They'll combine Esau. I keep them separate because it seems to be more consistent. It also puts the heart of the book at Terah. I put him in yellow. These are the generations of Terah. Who is Terah? Terah is the father of Abraham, which makes the heart of Genesis the Abrahamic covenant. And lastly, last week we talked about the styles argued of the book the allegory, saga, legend, myth, and history. And to recap a little bit on those, allegory is a story used to speak of a greater meaning. The story does not have to be true, but it 
can be true. And within this, there are two camps. There's the modern one, which generally takes allegory as a fictitious story. The author doesn't believe what he's writing, or he's not even aware that what he's writing is true or not true. And the more historical one, which you can look more back in church history, the historical allegory more focuses on the theology of the passages rather than the historicity of the passages. We also have saga. Saga is a group of stories told together to make one large continuous story. It seems to fit Genesis, except when you get into the details, and they say, well, the details are made up. They're from the imagination of the author, and I have a problem with that because I believe that the Bible is God's truth, that it is the inspired word, and that it's not an author making up details. These details were either recorded or God, through his inspiration, gave the author exactly what these people said. And then two of the common ones in more recent time are legend. Legend is an epic story that are t- is told as if it were true, but is not authentic. I give the example of King Arthur. There's debate as to whether or not he was a real person or not. There is no debate as to whether or not the stories are real, though. And then myth uh, overlaps with legend and often thrown into the same two categories, but a myth is a story that just isn't true and doesn't have to have any basis in truth whatsoever. The story itself is entirely a myth. And many people put this... Genesis in this category, and they say it is a story made up for a less civilized and sophisticated people. There were people that could not understand all the modern scientific uh, things that we have discovered over the past several hundred years, and as so, Moses and God gave his people this less sophisticated story to sort of cure their curiosity, so to speak. And that is where we ended off last week. And we concluded that, well, the only style left is history. So why is Genesis history? Well, the book is written in a way that records historical details. And Genesis fits this best. Genealogies. If you read through Genesis, you'll see many, many genealogies. Some would say a painful amount of genealogies. Uh, Same with the Torah, same with numbers, for example. Many numbers, many genealogies, and and people say, well, this is a lot, this is taxing to read through, but they're important. They're only important if it's history. If it's not history, there is no importance to recording genealogies and, uh, the next point, specific numbers in years. Genesis gives exact years on how long people lived. Why is this necessary if the story is an allegory? Why is this necessary if the story is a myth or a legend? And Genesis is written as if it's history. You're, you're hard to argue that Moses, if you, believe Moses didn't, if you believe Moses wrote the book, you're hard pressed to say that Moses didn't believe that this was history. That is a hard point to argue. And so Moses wrote this as if it's history because Probably for the simple reason, it's history. And lastly, archaeology does not disprove this. This is an important point, and and one that I think is often overlooked. Archaeology does not disprove the Torah. Take the Book of Mormon, for example. The Book of Mormon has been disproven time and time again through archaeology. They say, this took place here, and this is the details of that. And then they go and they search there and they find no evidence of that. And then they go to another site and they search that. And they go to all these sites where the Book of Mormon say these things happen. And time and time again, there's no archaeological proof for many of these things claimed in there. But when we go to Genesis and when we go to the Bible as a whole, archaeology doesn't disprove it. People will try and twist archaeology to say, well, this disproves it. In the same way, I believe people take it. Science and say, well, this disproves the Bible. It may disprove our presuppositions about certain things, but when we analyze them to the text, we see that archaeology and science do not disprove this. And I think this is an important point when it comes to history, because if you're arguing that this isn't history, but yet archaeology can point to the fact that it is history, that is another strong argument for the style of the book. And so, our conclusion is the style is historical narrative. It is also written in a way to draw lessons, truth, and meaning. You could categorize that all as theology. 
And as we quoted from Tremper Long in the third last week, it says, The Bible claims to be God's self-revelation to his people. Thus, it would not be wrong to describe the theological message of the book as its most important feature. In essence, the Bible's primary purpose is to picture God and our relationship with him. However, we must immediately qualify this statement so it is not abused. It is not uncommon today for scholars to make this assertion in order to minimize or even ignore the historical significance of the text. To say that theology is the most important aspect of the text is not to say that history is unimportant. Indeed, the Bible's consistent witness is that God, the God of the Bible acts in history. The book of Genesis is not a history-like story, but rather a story-like history. Though I am separating them here in order to facilitate in our study, the literary, historical, and theological aspects of the text are all intertwined. The God of Genesis is one who reveals himself to his people, theology, in space and time, history, and who chooses to inspire writings that serve as a memorial of those events, literary. And so Tremper Longman's point is that Genesis isn't just history. It's not just there to give us a history lesson of what's taken place. There's meaning behind the history. Now, every word that is written in the Bible uh, in those days was written at an expense. And I had a teacher in college who would always hammer on this point, and he, he would say, writing in those days was expensive. Paper was expensive. And so people didn't write things you know, often as we do, if we keep a diary and, and we go on and on and on about you know, stuff that may not really be important, but in, in the long span, it's important to us today, but everything that's written in the Bible is written for a reason, and the paper that it was written on was expensive. So these authors were very careful about what they wrote. And so why tell this story and not this story? There's more that happened in Abraham's life than is recorded in the Bible. Why does Moses choose to record these stories? Because he's trying to draw lessons, truth, and meaning out of the history to give originally to Israel to tell them, this is the God who is going to bring you out of Egypt, and this is the God who did bring you out of Egypt. This is the God who has saved you from the hands of the nations who are around you. This is who he is and what he is not. And so... Though Genesis is history, it's also very much theological. And as well, it has a prophetic nature to it like all Scripture. The scripture has the ability to be prophetic at any time it chooses. And whether or not it is a direct prophecy, it can be speaking prophetically of something. We see this in many cases quoted in the New Testament. Uh, to give you a quick example of this, uh, Hosea chapter 11 is quoted in Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew chapter 2, in verse 15, Matthew writes, uh, speaking of Jesus fleeing to Egypt, he says, This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets, Out of Egypt I called my son. And so Matthew goes back to this passage in Hosea, and he says, Hosea here says, out of Egypt I called my son. And Matthew says, this is speaking about Jesus. Oh, if we go to Hosea, Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to the idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms. But they did not know that I healed them. I led them out of the cords of kindness with the bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws and bent down to them and fed them. Now, you would read this passage, and you could go through the rest of Hosea. You would never have an understanding that verse 1 is talking about the Messiah. When he says, I called my son out of Egypt. And yet, Matthew recognizes the pattern that is going on here in Hosea. And he says, this, this patterns and this fulfills what the prophet Hosea wrote when he said, I called my son out of Egypt. 
And so the Bible has the ability to be prophetic within the text. And this includes in history, and we'll give many examples of this as we go through Genesis. And as we get into our literary terms, typology fits into this extremely well. And this is important uh, hermeneutics is the big word for it, but hermeneutics just means how you interpret the Bible. This is an important her- hermeneutical point that when we read the Bible, all the Bible is going to teach us theology, as well as all the Bible has the ability to be prophetic in nature because God will pattern something and use that pattern later on to s- fulfill it in a way that is greater. And we see Jesus pattern this again and again and again. At the same time, we also need to be careful in our interpretation of the Bible because many many will take this and say, well, this connects to this and this connects to this and this connects to this. And and you end up having uh, one argument that I heard in Genesis 1, the the firmament in the sky, that's Jesus. It's It's not waters in the sky, it's Jesus. And the way he got there was this wild rabbit trail that didn't make any sense because his interpretation of his rabbit trail just wasn't right. We need to be careful when we're interpreting passages to see how do the New Testament authors pick this up. And so as we go through Genesis and we study the history of it, we'll also study the theology of it, and we'll also study you know, in which passages is this picked up and is this patterned in the New Testament as well. Our next point is themes, the themes of the book, and this could be summarized as, what is the book about? The major themes of the book, the Abrahamic covenant is a very important point in this book. A reference to the Abrahamic covenant takes place over 20 times in this book in different passages, and these are direct references where the same kind of wording is used. And some will argue that the Abrahamic covenant is repeated from God, uh, and we'll go through this, it is repeated from God to a person seven times in this book. It's a major theme uh, of the book, as well as blessings and curses. And a subsection of this is to the whole world through Abraham, tying us back to the Abrahamic covenant. You see, as we go through this book that God will give a blessing, you see God gives a curse. God blesses Adam and Eve in the garden. They disobey, and we see the curses that follow upon the serpent and what then happens upon mankind. You see Cain kill Abel. You see God curses Cain because of that. You see this theme of blessing and cursing throughout the book, dependence on what the person believes and how they react if they have faith and hope. A major theme of Genesis is also the history of Israel and within that of mankind's origin. Now all of Genesis, and I talked about last week how I I don't like uh, how often the book is broken up into two sections to say 1 through 11 is somehow different than 12 through 50. As we go through 1 through 11, we'll see how 1 through 11 has the same theme, the same a point as the rest of the book. It's tracing this line that goes from Adam, that goes to Seth, that goes to Noah, and then through his son Shem, which leads to Terah, which leads to Abraham, to which the origin of Israel. And part of this, uh, I think a port- important point that confirms that this being a theme of this book is if we take Jesus' genealogy in Luke 3. And it starts with Jesus and it works his way back and it's how he's descended from the kings of Judah. And from the line of Judah, and how that takes them to Jacob, to Isaac, to Abraham, which takes them to Shem, Noah, Seth, Seth being the son of Adam, Adam being the son of God. Luke gives this genealogy that traces Jesus to the beginning to God. Genesis is consistent with this, which traces the line from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his 12 sons back to God when God formed Adam in the garden. And the whole book is tracing this line of Israel that leads to the Abrahamic covenants, which leads to our salvation. Another major theme of the book is God's transcendence and imminence. Transcendence is essentially God being overall in an all-powerful and glorious way. Imminence is God being present with us in a personal relationship kind of way. And we see this throughout Genesis. You see a chapter on God being transcendent, His power 
uh, over everything. You see this in Genesis 1, creation. You see God as Elohim, creator God, creating the world. You get to chapter 2, and it describes him as Yahweh Elohim, his personal relationship. You see chapter 2 is focusing on the imminence of God. And you see that through the different names of God used throughout the book. You see this with the flood. You see, God looks over the world and sees that they are corrupt, and God's conclusion is that he is going to destroy the world, transcendence. But Noah, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, imminence. The Tower of Babel, we see this with Abraham. We see this with Jacob's dream. And in the following chapter, we see God's transcendence. And so, Transcendence and imminence are a major theme within this book, showing that God is this powerful God that is overall, but at the same time, He is a God that is imminent and wants a personal relationship with us. The promised Messiah is also a major theme. The very first promise of the Messiah comes from Genesis chapter 3 in verse 15. In Genesis chapter 3 in verse 15, The Lord God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And we see that throughout Genesis, this theme here, and we'll get into that in our minor themes, this theme is tracing throughout the book of Genesis. And we see this promised Messiah again and again and again through Genesis. And Genesis in its history is recording how that comes from Adam to Abraham, where the covenant is given and how that spreads to the nation of Israel, which leads us into the Torah, why the law is given. And lastly, a major theme of the book, and I alluded to this earlier, is faith and hope. And this is the theology, you could say, behind the book and behind the Torah. Moses writes this to the first and second generation that goes out of Israel to tell them, Have faith, have hope, trust in God. If you are a people that does not have faith and does not have hope, you will rebel. And where does that lead them? You see in Numbers 14 that they're told, go into the land. And God says, send 12 men into theirs to spy out the the land. You know the song, 12 men want to spy on Cain and 10 were bad and two were good. The two came back with a good report. God has given us this land. The other ten say, oh, woe is us. We cannot take the land because there are giants. There are mighty men in the land. And we see that Israel at that time does not act in faith and hope. And what does that result in? Them wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And everything that led up to that point was a precursor to it. They're grumbling. They're complaining. They're not trusting in Moses. And Moses writes this book and gives them this history to say, have faith and hope. And within that, he's giving them examples within the book of, these are the people who lived by faith and hope and how God blessed them. And God was with them as a personal God who loved them. Once you lose faith and hope, you get into into these bad situations from sin. And Moses also recounts these in Genesis. Abraham and Isaac lying. They lie about their wife and they say, she is my sister, to try and not be killed and have their wife taken from them by these pagan kings. But they were to have faith and hope in God, that God would protect them according to his promises. Joseph's brothers did not act in faith and hope. When God had clearly given Joseph two dreams, their reaction was, let's kill our brother. See Israel again wandering in the wilderness, refusing to take the promised land. And even Moses and Aaron themselves did not act in faith and hope when God says, speak to the rock, and they struck the rock. And God says, you cannot enter the promised land because you did not obey. And so a major theme throughout Genesis and throughout all the Torah, all these major themes in Genesis are also major themes throughout the Torah. Faith and hope is prominent. That you need to have faith and hope and trust in God that He is good and He will provide and will take care of you no matter what your situation is, no matter how hard what He is asking you to do. And I would argue that this theme does extend throughout the whole Bible and it is a call to us as well. That we are to be people who have faith and hope in God.
We have minor themes of the book, and these can be described as motifs. Motif is a literary term that we'll flesh out a little bit more, but it's basically a reoccurring theme within a book. And so I've labeled these minor themes because they're themes that aren't necessarily prevalent throughout everything, but they reappear often throughout the book. The seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, from Genesis 3.15, and part of that is the seed of Abraham. You see this promised seed given uh, to the serpent, to Adam and Eve. You see how we take that to Abraham and he is promised a seed as well. You see a common theme throughout the book is the rejection of the first and the choosing of the second. You see that Cain was rejected by God, but Abel, his sacrifice was pleasing to the Lord. Again, this goes into faith and hope. Esau and Jacob, Isaac and Ishmael. You'll see this reoccurring theme of the rejection of the first and the choosing of the second. Another theme is returning to the one who spoke harshly to you, returning to them for salvation. See hostility and enmity and also reconciliation. Jacob and Esau had this hostility and this enmity towards each other, but in the end they were reconciled to one another. The promise of land is given to Abraham. They also see alienation, that someone is sent out because they are not included in the promises given by God. You see Ishmael is sent out. You see that Esau is taken out of the land by his own choice, and it is given to Jacob. You see this alienation, which very much reflects in the Abrahamic covenant. You also see numbers. Genesis introduces us to the importance of numbers in Hebrew culture. You have the number one, because God is one. You have the number three, which reflects the Trinity. You have the number seven, being a divine number, a perfect number, seven days of creation. You have the number 10, another perfect and complete number. You have the number 12, the number 40. There's a lot of numbers uh, that are used that we are introduced to in Genesis that we see throughout Scripture that are patterned, and these are important in Hebrew culture. We also see another thing that's very important in Hebrew culture is the punning of names. You'll see that names are used and there's a pun and that God will use their name to do something that is reflective of their name. Abraham being the father of many, becoming the great father. We also see uh, the theme of creation as well as ruin and destruction. And you see this theme of God creating and you see destruction of that. And you see the flood, the destruction of creation. But then you see God bring about what you could call a new creation through Noah. And you see this, this theme of creation and ruin and destruction amidst that because of sin. Another motif in the book is countering the nation's conception of God's and a God. And the nations had some very, you could say, unpleasant ideas about who God was, uh, what the gods were, and why is God calling Israel to go and take the land? Why is God bringing them out of Egypt and say, go conquer these people? And often in our Western culture, we struggle with this. Why would God tell them to go and, and, and kill these, these nations? That just seems very wrathful and mean. And when we look into these nations, these, these nations, they were nothing good. In many ways, they would make North Korea look very good today. One of these practices that was very common in these days was that they would have these bronze hands that were casted, and they would heat them up till they're red hot, and then they would sacrifice their firstborn infants on that. These were horrible pagan people that had sinned greatly against God, and part of the promise of the Abrahamic covenant is, for 400 years you will wander in a land that is not your own, but then you will go into the land Why the 400 years? God says, because the sins of the nations into that land, they're not yet complete. But by the time of the Exodus, God has had enough with those nations' sins, and he calls Israel to go in and purge those nations. And so Genesis, as we'll go through, because it was written to the first and second generation who exited Egypt, we'll see that Moses is spending a significant amount of time countering what these nations' concept of God was to say, Israel, don't believe that. This is how you are to believe. This is who God is and what he is not. And as well, redemption, redemption being to a garden-like state. 
Another category of themes that we could say is Bible themes. And I said faith and hope is a theme that we see throughout all, all of the Bible. Another one that we see is the kingdom of God. Paul Drake says, The kingdom comes at the end of time as the culmination of everything that has happened from creation until now. And we see that Genesis starts off and promises the seed, and we see how that is taken to the Abrahamic covenants, and this promise is given to Israel, and out of that comes the law. Here's how you live holy before God. Then comes a man named David, and David wants to build a house for the, for the Lord. And the Lord says, no, I will build a house for you. And God gives the Davidic covenant to establish the Davidic covenants with David, in which his offspring would rule on it forever. And we see this theme throughout the Bible leading to this kingdom of God that will come. And you see that at the end of time, this kingdom will come as the culmination of everything that has happened from creation until now. We also see a major theme throughout the Bible is salvation. Ernie Armstrong and Matt Woodmass write, Read the scriptures through the grid of salvation, the prophetic word by the map of righteousness. Uh, I forgot to mention this earlier, but this is the book that it comes out of. It's hermeneutics, uh, the prophetic scriptures, the guide for understanding the prophetic nature of, of scripture. When I was talking about how all scripture has the ability to be prophetic, he goes into detail about you know, why that is the case. But in here he talks about how you see this motif of salvation throughout all of scripture and how all of scripture is bringing us to salvation again and again and again. And though often, and you could very much easily argue that alongside salvation is destruction almost every time. You see that uh, salvation is there, but at the same time you see destruction alongside of that because of people's sin. And to give a few examples of that, Noah. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man. God saved Noah. At the same time, you have the destruction of the rest of the world. You have Lot, the salvation of Lot, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You have the Red Sea, Israel being saved. You also have the destruction of, e- of Egypt. You have the promised land, Israel's salvation to the destruction of the nations. Our salvation, also there is a side of destruction that comes to it. The death of Christ is very destructive, but you also have the destruction of sin and death. The second coming, you have Israel will be saved and those who come to faith in the millennium, they will be saved The Antichrist, the seed of the serpent, Satan and the nations will receive destruction. The final battle, the faithful will be saved, but the rebellious nations will be destroyed by the Father. Even the great white throne, we are glorified and those who are faithless are sent to hell. You have this theme of salvation that runs through the whole Bible, but also at the same time you have destruction because we have sin. And sin needs to be dealt with. And so we have this theme of salvation, but alongside that, we also have this theme of destruction, God destroying wickedness and sin. Those are the themes of the book. And next is the purpose. As I said, themes is what is the book about? The world's origin, Israel's origin and history, the Abrahamic covenants, as well as history and promise. The purpose then is, why was the book written? You have what the book is about, but, but why record it? Well, it's to recount how God made the world, which is to counter the common theories of that day and to show who God is and who and what he is not, counter the pagans' thoughts about their deities, the origin of sin, the origin of Israel, God's promise to the world, and specifically to Israel through the Abrahamic covenant, the promised seed. Now, why the book was, re- was written to is to recount these things. That leads us into the other question. Well, then why recount those things? It is to tell Israel who their God is and why they are his chosen people. To give them understanding of why they should conquer the promised land. To show them faith and hope. Those who had these and those who did not. And to show God is faithful to his promises. And that is key. In the next it is chapter 2 and verses 23 through 25. It says, During those many days the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered. 
His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Genesis was written to recount the promises of God to Israel. We get into Exodus and it says God remembered the promises in Genesis. And what did God do? He freed his people. In Deuteronomy 1 Verse 8, it says, See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them and to their offspring after them. And we see Deuteronomy, the call to fulfill this promise for them to go and take the land that was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to Israel. You read Joshua. The theme, major theme of Joshua is fulfilling what is commanded in Deuteronomy. What is commanded in Deuteronomy? This is commanded. Joshua says Israel did this for the most part. Then there's the unique characteristics of the book. And this is basically what makes the book special. There's creation, the fall, the flood, the patriarchs, the origin of Israel, the Abrahamic covenants. And you could say all of these... And the main unique characteristic of the book that I would argue, all the rest of Scripture is based off of what is recorded in Genesis. Genesis being the first book of the Bible, the first book of the Torah would be the first book that you would read if you started from the beginning. Everything else in Scripture is based off of Genesis and the promises and the history given in it. We talked about the genealogy of Jesus in Luke it's based off of much of what is recorded in Genesis. The promise of the offspring connects to the Davidic covenant, takes us to Jesus, starts in Genesis. Genesis is the beginning. You know, bitter sheets in the beginning. In Genesis origins, generation, it's the book of beginnings because it's the beginning of the rest of Scripture in which all Scripture, all the rest of Scripture is based off of what is recorded in Genesis. To close off our time I wanted to talk about literary terms, and I felt that this was important. And again, to say, you don't have to memorize every literary term that I'm going to give tonight. When we come across one of these, I'll explain it. I'll explain what it is and how we see it. But the reason why I've included this as our 10th introductory question is because we argue that Moses wrote the book. And part of our argument in that is the complexity of the book, how it is one cohesive unit with the Torah as well, and how the complexity of the book we see uh, very much through the literariness that Moses uses in this, which also speaks of Moses was an intelligent man. And Moses was no uh, stupid, more uh, ape-like, more caveman-like man who could not understand creation. That If we go into the literary complexity of Genesis, we can argue that these were a very sophisticated people, a very knowledgeable and understanding people that could understand the truth and history as it is given. The first literary term that I want to talk about is patterns. Patterns. There's parallelism and then there's a chiasm. These are two poetic structures that are used throughout the book. And parallelism is parallel points in a series that repeat in order. You have A, B, C, A, B, C. For example, the six days of creation. You have light and darkness. And then you have water and sky, land and the plants. Those are the first three days. Day four goes back to A, filling the light and the darkness with the sun, moon, and stars. And B is filling the waters and the skies with the fish and the birds. And C is filling the land with animals and man. There's this literary pattern that is in creation that Moses records to say, oh, this is a pattern that we see with God creating the world with the six days of creation. And we see many other uh, parallelisms throughout Genesis. There are parallel points. These parallel points can be from two different sections. Uh, for example, you'll see creation and the flood parallel each other. You also see that the flood and the destruction of Sodom parallel each other. A parallelism is also not limited to a number of points, but it could go to A and Z and beyond if the author desires. I just it did A, B, C because it's small and it's good for the sake of time. There's also the pattern of a chiasm. And chiasms are used throughout the Bible as well. 
And they are parallel points in a series that repeat in reverse order with the center points or the center two points being the climax of the poetic structure. So A, B, and then X, B, A, or you can have two centers. And an example of that, again, is certain creation days. And God said, let the waters under heaven be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And you see this pattern that's going together, and what it does is it points to this central point. You have a command, a command, and the heart of it is obedience. That the natural order obeys God when he speaks. And then it continues the fulfillment of the command. Now again, with patterns, uh, the parallel points of a chiasm, they can be similar or contrasting. You could say same or opposite. Example, you can have a, a and A be life and life. You could also have it be life and death. Right? They're contrasting points, but they're speaking of somewhat of the same thing. Another example of this is truth and truth, or truth and lie being a parallel point. Chiasms as well are not limited to how long they can be. And this goes into the complexity of the book. There will often be stretches across many chapters of chiasms, and there can be multiple chiasms overlapping each other. And this is something we won't get into a whole lot other than to just show you them and talk about them as we go through. But know that there's a complexity where you have chiasm within chiasm and overlapping chiasms. And to argue that four people wrote the book and somehow this all just lined up in this very poetic way that was unintentional doesn't make much sense to me at all. But if we argue Moses wrote the book, and Moses being a very sophisticated and very intelligent man, seeing that Moses uses these poetic structures overlapping each other to drive a central point really speaks to the complexity of the book. And as I argue, it's a book that could only be given through the inspiration of God. An example of ones that stretch across many chapters are the Abraham story, Jacob's story, the Joseph story. This is one of the ones we see for Abraham. This is one of the ones we see for Jacob. One of the ones we see for Joseph. You can see that they can get quite long and can be quite complex. And so those are our patterns, two of the kind of patterns of parallelisms that we see in Genesis. Another thing that we see in Genesis is foreshadowing. Uh, I could give many examples of this, but to make it short, a uh, foreshadow we see is uh, Isaac's love for meat, or your translation may say game. See, Isaac has a love for meat, and we also see that this is part of his downfall in which he is fooled by Jacob. You almost see a little bit of a foreshadowing going into that. And there are ones that are far more complex with that. I give that example because our next literary term is key words and phrases. And use the same example of Isaac deceived by Jacob. A key word that is used throughout this passage is the word meat and game. Said, which is used eight times. The word tasty food. Matam, variations of this word are used six times. You know, by recognizing the key words of a passage, we can understand, that the, understand the point the author is making. As Bruce Walke says, the repetition makes the point apparent. Isaac's love for his sensual tastes has distorted his spiritual tastes. He is deceived through his, the tasty game this tasty meat, this tasty food that Jacob brings to him, he is deceived by that as part of the deception that allows Jacob to be blessed by God. Key phrases are essentially the same thing as key words, except it's several words as long. Six days of creation. You see the phrase, there was evening and there was morning, day, and it states the day. Vahieva, vahivoker, yom whatever day. This phrase, the series of words, repeats six times at the end of each day of creation. The author's point is to show us the completeness of the day according to the natural cycle established by God on the first day. There's morning and there's evening, a 24-hour period of time. We also see in the genealogy of Genesis 5, the phrase, thus were the days of person, Adam. His days were 
this many years and he died. You see this, and he died, and he died, and he died over and over and over. But then one notices the stark contrast when you get to Enoch and you expect the phrase, and he died, but it's not given. It says, Enoch was no more, for the Lord took him. You immediately know the contrast that is given there because you have this repeated phrase, and then when it's not used, you see the contrast of it. There's motif, and we talked about these being the minor themes of the book. Oxford defines motif as a decorative image or design, especially a repeated one in forming a pattern. A dominant or recurring idea in an artist's work. In essence, a motif is a repeated theme. It's something that is stated, and you see that repeated again and again and again and hinted to throughout a work, in this case, throughout Genesis, throughout the Torah, throughout the Bible. And as we talked about these minor themes, these are all motifs that we see throughout Genesis and the Torah. A motif that we see is the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea. You see this promise is given in the Abrahamic covenant and is repeated throughout Genesis and the Torah. And motifs will often contain a key phrase or a key word. It was originally given to Abraham in Genesis 13, 16. He says, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. See it repeated in Genesis 15. Genesis 22. In Genesis 26, it's repeated to Isaac. In Genesis 32, it's repeated to Jacob. You see in Genesis 41, speaking of the grain of Egypt, it says, And Joseph stored up the grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea. Somebody who's reading this, a Hebrew boy who's reading this for the first time, would immediately recognize the parallel that's going on here. And you see how this is speaking in some ways, to the promise given to Abraham that just like the grain that was stored up in Egypt was so plentiful that it could not be counted, Moses records this for a specific reason to tell Israel, that is how many people you are going to be. That is going to be your generations. And in Deuteronomy 1.10, we say the Lord, it says, the Lord your God has multiplied you and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. The fulfillment of this motif that we see We also see that it came from the 70 that went down to Egypt. In Hebrews 11, it says, Therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of the heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of the sand by the seashore. Speaking of God fulfilling his promise to Abraham. So we see this motif used throughout Genesis, throughout the Torah, and even extending into the Bible. As many times it's also used in the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. There's inclusio. Inclusio is a literary term that means a statement or a theme of a statement that appears at the beginning of a story or a passage or near to the beginning, which is also repeated at the end. You see this parallel? You could look at it. Is there a chiasm here? No, it's likely just an inclusio. And these are, can be similar contrast or fulfillment. For example, Genesis 16 with Abraham Hagar and a child, you see an inclusio take place here. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. The rest of the chapter speaks about the details that took place. The chapter ends and says, And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abraham was, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. You see that it's almost a bookend closing of the story. The theme at the beginning is repeated at the end to close it off. In this case, to close the story of Hagar bearing Ishmael, Abraham's firstborn. You also have comparisons and contrasts. A comparison is a consideration or estimate of similarities or dissimilarities between two things or people. It's two or more things that are similar and often being Uh, and are often being compared, often to show similarities between uh, the two of these, or to show a blessing and a curse extended to both. For example, you have the three stories of a patriarch lying about his wife being his sister. These stories are compared to each other, and when you get into part of the reason why, you see that the blessing given to Abraham is also the same blessing that is passed along to Isaac. You can also see uh, a deception. You see that it is a deception that ends in a blessing. The covenant made with Abimelech. The covenant shows that Isaac has received the same blessing as his father. Uh, 
A contrast is a state of being strikingly different from something else in juxtaposition, which just means close proximity or in close association. And two or more things that are opposite or similar but have reactions, or have different reactions, obedience and faith, acceptance or rejection, blessing uh, or curses and things like that. Noah, you see, Noah is faithful and obedient. The rest of the world has no faith and they are disobedient. Acceptance, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, are accepted. Lot, Ishmael, and Esau are rejected. Blessings, Israel, curses, Egypt. And the broken pattern or something different uh, set by the norm, by the author. I gave the example of Genesis 5 with Enoch. is a contrast to the rest of the chapter of all those who died. You have irony, and irony is basically uh, the expression of one's meaning using language that would norm- normally signify the opposite, typically for humorous or emphatic effect. It's one's choices often for their own benefit or self-preservation come back in an unexpected negative way. For example, Lot chooses Sodom to hold his wealth, and we see that Sodom and Lot's wealth are destroyed by God. Joseph is sold to his brothers as a slave. His brothers bow down to him as a ruler in the country of his enslavement. There's an irony that is taking place there. Mankind builds a tower, the Tower of Babel, to reach heaven. And yet the text says God comes down to the earth to see it. A little bit of irony going on there. And we have typology. Typology of Christ, of God, of Satan and the Antichrist, and of future things. And typology is the thing we'll close with here. It's a person or thing or a nation that acts as a type of something else, usually greater or greater in the sense of worse. They pattern something with striking similarities. It will be a comparison. There will often be contrast in the sense that the person does not live up to the full extent of what they are a type of. And one say, in a sense, you could say the person is not as extreme, generally in the sense of them being worse. You know, the similarities and the differences and typology is usually a prophetic parallel. You have typologies of Christ. You have Isaac and the ram. It pictures Christ's sacrificial death for sin and resurrection. And Isaac also pictures Christ as the chosen seed. You have Joseph. Joseph was sold for the wages of a slave. He was as good as dead and he was considered so. He was resurrected from a grave-like state and became a ruler. Um, and he be, brings salvation to the, rule, to the world, and then he reigns over the world. Jesus was betrayed for the wages of a slave. He died on a cross, resurrected from the grave, brought salvation to the world, reigns in heaven, and will physically reign over the entire world. There are striking similarities between Joseph and Jesus, Joseph being a type of Christ is in typology. And so the Joseph story, though it takes place before Jesus, his story has this prophetic nature which Jesus fulfills. You have typology of God. You have Abraham willingly offers Isaac, his son, the chosen seed as a sacrifice. It pictures the father willingly offering his son, the true chosen seed, as a sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 11 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac And he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Isaiah 53, 10 says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, speaking of his chosen servant, speaking of Jesus. He's put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. See, striking similarities between Abraham and the father Abraham being a typology of the Father. You have it of Satan, the Antichrist being evil and sin, the seed of the serpent. The ultimate seed of the serpent is the Antichrist. You see, Cain acts in the way of the seed of the serpent by killing his brother. You see the line in the nation of Nimrod, which comes Babylon, which persecutes the Jewish people, um, exiles them from their lands. You see striking similarities with the line in the nation of Nimrod to what the Antichrist will do. You have the Pharaoh, who is very much like the Antichrist and Satan in how he acts and deals with Israel. I'm going to jump a few slides ahead to close. Take us back to our question, why Genesis? 
And the ultimate answer is truth. It's truth. Truth is God's reality, which is revealed to us through Scripture. Why should we study Genesis? Why should we look into Genesis? There's literally literary depth of Genesis and the author's use of these literary terms throughout the book shows that he's trying to accomplish more than just relaying history. He's speaking of truth. Truth about what happened in history, but truth about God, who he is. And as we know, God is the same for a thousand years, for two thousand years, a couple days, decides he gets bored and decides to change his character. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as a result, God's truth, truth being God's reality, which is revealed to us through Scripture, is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Because God is the same. And so the way, uh, the way that God reveals himself in Genesis and who he is is important. And so the question is, why Genesis? Because it's God's truth. And from what we learn in Genesis and from what we see in Genesis, we'll see God's truth and how that applies to the rest of Scripture and how that applies to our life. And it's important. And it'll be important as we get into our Our next lesson, we have a testimony service next week, but the next one after that, we're going to be talking about why we should take Genesis as history and why evolution isn't compatible with the Bible. Why should we take God's truth at his word? So that is where we will close off tonight. Join me in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for Genesis. Lord, I thank you for the complexity of this book. And Lord, how we're dealing with a book There is a lot to it. And Lord, we will not nearly even touch the depths. We will just graze the surface of the depths of this book. And Lord, it shows us who you are. It shows us your truth. And Lord, we should marvel in the complexity of this book and the complexity of your sovereign hand throughout all history. Lord, I pray that as we go out from here, Lord, that your blessings would be upon us. Lord, that we would be Christians who live a life of faith and hope. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. On Christ the soul is-